Hello everyone and welcome back to our third lecture where we have now finished looking at Immanuel Kant's metaphysics and epistemology, the synthetic a priori, and the noumenon, as well as the context to Kant's philosophy and the birth of German idealism and romanticism. So now we're going to begin moving toward uh, the most important, in my opinion, the most important philosopher of the German idealists and the romantics that few people know and certainly even fewer people have read, and that is Johann Fichte. Fichte is the first major interpreter of Kant in the German tradition. He's the one who's going to start building what becomes German idealism and romanticism from the foundations laid forth by Kant, principally from Kant's synthetic a priori and the noumenon, which is why we had to understand what those concepts were for Kant before we move to Fichte. So Fichte uh, was a contemporary of Kant, and then he, he lived after Kant, and Fichte's, Fichte was a philosopher who is part of what is becoming the Jena School of Romanticism, Jena University, the same place where Hegel's going to be teaching, and Fichte becomes an influence on Hegel. But Fichte gets, gets himself into some trouble around the turn of the century. In the early 1800s, it forces him to leave Jena. But he's a tremendous, he's a, he's a very important philosopher because of what he's doing with Kant's philosophy, as well as where he's breaking with Kant's philosophy and reaching even further back to older traditions in philosophy, principally the philosophy of consciousness and logos from Christianity, as well as the philosophies of self-introspection from Augustine and Plotinus. So Fichte is writing in the same era as Kant. Now most of his work unfortunately is still in German, but there are some things that have been translated into English, like the vocations of man, as well as the uh, foundations of natural right. Most people are going to be familiar with Fichte, if they're familiar with Fichte, through his uh, address to the German nation. Uh, if there's anything you've read from Fichte, it's probably that. If you're aware of anything from, from him, it's most likely that. Fichte is going to run with the synthetic a priori and lead us into the most important aspect of romantic philosophy, which is the philosophy of the first person. It's the philosophy of consciousness. It is the philosophy that is rooted uh, in the Hebraic theological tradition, the I am. And he's going to argue, contrary to Descartes, who gave us the cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, he says, no, I am because I am. So before we begin to look specifically at the foundations for Fichte, we need to go back to un we need to go back and understand the philosophies that Fichte is building on besides Kant, because we already looked at Kant. So Fichte is reaching back to older traditions of rationalism that he feels Kant both rightly built from, but unjustifiably moved away from, right? So this is Kant's mistake in Fichte's reading of Kant. It's that he doesn't play with the implicit notions of the self-conscious. Self-consciousness that is in Plato, it's implied in Plato, or at least Fichte thinks it's implied in Plato. Uh, it becomes much more apparent in Plotinus. And then, of course, you get to St. Augustine, who synthesizes Plato and Plotinus with the philosophy of I am and Logos that, come, that came out of Christianity. And so this is what Fichte is reaching back to. He feels that Kant did not do enough with these philosophies, and therefore Kant, while moving us in the right direction, nevertheless, we can't be satisfied with what Kant uh, provided. So if we remember from the first lecture where I was talking about Plato and his concept of innate ideas, Fichte is going to be arguing the same way that Kant does in a certain sense, but he moves it in a slightly different direction. Not only do the innate ideas that we have 
presuppose that they can be experienced, but the whole purpose of innate ideas is to lead to a form of self-consciousness. Because with the innate ideas, you begin to rationally introspect yourself and you're wrestling with yourself, you're wrestling with your own ideas and you're forming rational thought processes this way. So you can see right off the bat here that in reaching back to Plato and in keeping Kant, the Romantics are claiming that if you move, if you move down the route that the empiricists go through the tabula rasa, through the destruction of innate ideas, there is no self. And in fact, that is exactly what Hume reached. If you run with the empiricist thought experiments to their logical conclusions, you don't exist, I don't exist, there is no self. So there's ultimately no grounding for self-knowledge, and without the grounding for self-knowledge, there is no grounds for any knowledge. And so that is what Fichte is trying to recover here. And so Fichte looks back and he recognizes that Plato and Plotinus are going to be allies for him in the development of his philosophy, but he also understands that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John, St. John, author of the Gospel of St. John, they're also going to be major influences on Fichte, right? So as the same time that the Greeks through Plato and Plotinus are developing a form of rationalism, the same form of rationalism in a slightly different aspect, uh, which moves us more in the direction of moral natural law, natural moral law is being developed in the Hebraic and Christian traditions. So now we have to understand something about religion here and theology. If philosophy is generally misunderstood by the public, well then so is theology and so is religion. Uh, this is especially true for people who identify and practice religion, and this is even more true with the people who critique religion. So if we go back to the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, we know it in the West as the Old Testament, and if you read through it, a lot of people are confused. Because what, what, what exactly is going on in the Bible? Well, if you have a knowledge of the Christian hermeneutical tradition, you understand that this idea of reading the Bible literally, this idea of reading the Bible historically or scientifically, is in fact a product of the last 100 years. It's a result of the fundamentalist, fundamentalist modernist controversy that erupted in the United States and then it moved across the Atlantic Ocean and it reached England. This is largely an English-speaking uh, phenomenon. And it's largely a Protestant uh, phenomenon. And within it being a Protestant phenomenon, it is generally a low church, reformed, Calvinist, as well as evangelical phenomenon. The Lutherans, for instance, as well as the older traditions of Anglicanism, are really, they are in, in most ways immune uh, from this because they took, they saved much of the Greco Catholic hermeneutical tradition which is reading the Bible philosophically and allegorically. Uh, this goes all the way back before Augustine, although Augustine is the major figure, of course, in Christianity, who through his allegorical readings of the scripture sort of laid the foundations for the dominant form of hermeneutics there. But this goes back to the, to the, uh, to the Jews as well. Uh, somebody like Philo of Alexandria is reading the Bible uh, allegorically. The Jewish community in Alexandria the Hellenic Jewish community going back, as far as we can tell, in the 3rd and the 4th uh, centuries before the Common Era, which is when the Old Testament is really being compiled, they're already reading the Bible uh, philosophically. And so Fichte's, Fichte is a philosopher as well as a controversial theologian, uh, but in Fichte's reading of Hebraic theology, he realizes that when you look at the Old Testament and you read it through and then you reach into the New Testament, that a major, a major idea in metaphysics as well as a major idea 
in epistemology is being developed over the course of a thousand years uh, through biblical writing. And this is the idea of the self. This is the idea of the self-conscious. You get this uh, in as early as the book of Genesis. Uh, that's from Augustine reading uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2. But this really becomes apparent in the book of Exodus when Moses is supposedly, you know, he's talking to the burning bush, which is a story that most people don't understand. I don't really want to go in and explain that because that will distract us from Fichte here. But in Moses' dialogue with God, God responds and says, I am that which I am. All right, so this is going to become a major theme in Fichte's philosophy of the first person, his philosophy of the self. Now, we have to understand something about God here in the Christian tradition, as well as the Jewish tradition. God is logos. God is reason. God is wisdom, okay? God is not what most people who practice religion, as well as the critics of religion, often caricature, uh, caricature, characterize as, you know, they draw these caricatures of there's this man with a big beard up in the clouds and he sort of intervenes through everything. That, that is not actually the understanding of God in the Jewish and the Christian traditions formally, right? So in, in the development of this theology, this theological philosophy, of the self-conscious, which is coming out of Hebraic theology, Fichte recognizes a developmental pattern in how the Jewish writers and then eventually the Christian writers are playing with this theme. If we recall, if we have a knowledge of the Bible, we can go back to the Torah, which are the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, right? The people who speak for God and that means these are the people who speak wisdom, who speak reason, right? The prophets in the rest of the, the latter books of the Hebrew Bible, the prophets are people who speak for God. What that means is they're the speakers of wisdom and reason because prophet simply means somebody who speaks. A prophet is not somebody who's predicting about the future. A prophet is simply somebody who speaks who speaks reasonably, right? He speaks the Logos. That's what the prophet is. But if we go back to the first five books of the Bible, what you have are the patriarchs and the prophets, right? The patriarchs, the prophets, and the priests. These are the people who speak for wisdom. These are the people who speak for reason. And the reason why we have that is because, you know, the, these people... Uh, the prophets and the priests, you know, they have a lot of time on their hands. So these are the people who are able to dwell and begin meditating on philosophical themes. They're the ones who are meditating on questions of metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, as well as ethics, and uh, occasionally as well as aesthetics. But so they're the ones meditating on these ideas, and they're the ones who are eventually going to begin speaking about uh, the role of uh, reason and wisdom, right? If we move forward again to the Gospel of St. John, the beginning of St. John's Gospel is, in the beginning was the Logos, or the Word, that's the translation into English, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The Christian tradition reaching back to St. Paul, St. Irenaeus, Origen, Augustine, they're reading that in, all, in, in the beginning of Genesis, right? So creation, again, rationally ordered. There's a wisdom to the world, and this wisdom to the world is governed by certain natural law. It's governed by natural law. Okay, so the beginnings of the self-conscious, self-conscious reflection in the Bible begins with the priests and the prophets and the patriarchs. But eventually, the Jews are going to begin developing that it's not simply them. In fact, everybody has this ability to uh, rationally introspect and wrestle with reason, right? This is, these are the stories about wrestling with God. And in the Old Testament, you could read the Jewish, Jewish expositors 
of the Hebrew Bible here. This is what those stories represent, wrestling with reason. You're wrestling with your so-called inner demon, your inner conscience. You're wrestling with now the voice of God, right? The voice of God. What the voice of God means in the Hebrew Bible is not that there's this guy in heaven or the clouds who's actually like speaking to you in any literal sense. What this simply means is there is a law of reason within human beings that tells you, that gives you an awareness of whether or not you're doing things right or wrong. It gives you an awareness of whether you're satisfied with your life or not. It gives you an awareness if you're moving down the wrong track, if you're becoming alienated with yourself. So that's what the voice of God means. So again, it's this rational part of our soul. It's the rational part of the mind. And we're wrestling with this. We're turning inward to ourselves to try to understand ourselves. And then this gets picked up in the Christian New Testament when we're looking at people like the Apostle Paul, right? Paul then builds from that, that long tradition coming out of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and then he goes and he says, well, this is the law that is written on the hearts of all men, right? So now it's in the hearts of all men. And this is where the, the New Testament gets a bit confusing because we tend to read the New Testament chronologically, the way it's been developed. So we read the Gospels first, and then we're reading the Pauline epistles and the other texts that come after the Pauline epistles. Uh, but the Pauline epistles are written earlier than the Gospels. The earliest Gospel, the general dating for the earliest Gospel is the Gospel of Mark. It's around the year 70. And then the Gospel of John is written sometime in the 90s, right before uh, his death. But even though we read John first, chronologically, John is actually after Paul in a historical chronology. And the Germans are aware of this. Uh, most people have been aware of this uh, since the rise of uh, biblical, uh, the rise of modern biblical scholarship beginning in the 1500s. And so Paul starts writing about the law in everybody's heart. And then St. John says that in the beginning is the Logos. So we have that development coming out of Hebraic Christian theology of wrestling with your inner demons, so to speak, wrestling with the voice of God, wrestling with the voice of reason that is within you, because that is what makes us human. That is the idea of the Imago Dei in the Jewish Christian tradition, is that you are a rational animal. They're aware that we're animals, but we're unique. We're Imago Dei because we have this gift of reason, and that's why we're made in the image of God, because God is reason. So Fichte is playing with these ideas in theology as well as in philosophy, the same type of rationalism expressed in a different manner in Plato and Plotinus, and he's attempting to synthesize this with Kant's philosophy. And in doing so, he's going to develop the philosophy of the I, the I is. He's going to develop the philosophy of the I am. He's going to, to develop the philosophy of the ego, right? This is not the egoism of liberal philosophy, the ethical egoism of people like Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, Spinoza, or Adam Smith. This is an ego of the self conscious, right? So this is where uh, the, the other traditions of continental philosophy build from. And in a lot of ways, you can understand not only is the rest of continental philosophy rooted in German Romanticism, but in a lot of ways, it goes all the way back to the Hebraic, Christian, philosophical, theological traditions. It's, a lot of it's rooted in Augustine. Most people in philosophy know that if you look at people like Freud, Freud is an Augustinian. The existentialists are in, in very weird ways. They're Augustinians too. And Nietzsche is an Augustinian. The, the, the Romantics are Augustinian. And that is because in the Christian tradition, you have a unity of the phenomenological with the noumenal. You have a unity, a harmony of the transcendent with the 
the empirical, and that is hashed out by Augustine most explicitly among the Christian philosophers, but then among Augustine's interpreters, right? And so what the empiricists did again was in, in destroying, in moving us away, eliminating innate ideas, eliminating the logos that is within us and pushing us only to the empirical, only to the, to the phenomenological. You've now destroyed the transcendent. You've destroyed the logos, the innate logos of the self, and you've destroyed what Kant calls the noumenal. And, you know, if you remember from our, my first lectures on Kant's synthetic a priori, right, the synthetic a priori was his way of reuniting those two concepts in philosophy, and then his explanation of how we have knowledge in this noumenal world, which binds the transcendent and the phenomenological tr together. It is, in a lot of ways, just a new interpretation of the long-standing Christian understanding of the world and of the self. So Fichte is playing the same game that Kant is, but he's moving us, he's, he's recoursing back, and he's, he's taking much more of Plato, much more of Plotinus, and much more of Augustine than Kant did. Because Fichte decides in his readings of Kant and in his rebuttal to the empiricists, it's not so much that there's this transcendental realism, although there is that, or this empirical realism where we have innate ideas that are validated from experience. It is the self-conscious. It's that which is aware of oneself and one's nature, one who is aware of his surroundings, one who is aware of his interconnectedness with not only the world, but with other people and with the moral community, right? So according to Fichte, there is a moral law that consists in the mutual recognition of rational beings. And their spheres of freedom. He gets this from Augustine. There is a law that consists in the mutual recognition of rational beings and their spheres of freedom. Its essence is only, its essence is enforced, its essence is enforced by rationality. And you can also see here Fichte, who's also working in political philosophy and moral philosophy, is directly challenging the liberal philosophies of the social contract that are coming out from people like Hobbes and Locke and Spinoza. Because what is Hobbes' Hobbes's claim? Hobbes' claim is there is no mutual recognition of rationality in the state of nature. It is just a violent war of all against all that leads to that life that is solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. And so the result of this is we need to have a state that basically keeps the peace. We need a state that keeps the peace. And Locke is going to be arguing the same thing. The only difference in Locke is it's not the fear of violent death that mandates the rise of the state. It's the fear of the loss of property and the inability to work uh, to work our property for the purposes of production, which lead to consumerism. Uh, that, is Locke's, uh, that is Locke's concern, and so the state in Locke is basically the political organization that establishes property rights that allow you to work your land, build stuff, create stuff, and then start selling it to other people so you're able to start consuming. All right, so... Fichte is rejecting that entire tradition of empirical, liberal, political philosophy. He says, no, there is a rational, moral recognition within all humans of their spheres of freedom. And this is the beginning of not only uh, self-awareness, which moves into self-consciousness, but this is what leads to the interconnectedness of rational human beings, as well as their relationship with each other in community and, uh, and 
eventually the formation of a nation and a state, right? So the idea of a state and of the constitution that comes out from people like Fichte and the rest of the German romantics is not this social, constru socially constructed constitution of Hobbes and Locke. It is an organic, it is an organic process that comes out of rational thought. So constitutions and the states and the nation will eventually embody all the rational, the rational aspects of one's heritage. And so this leads us to the vocation of man, where he, he is again playing with all of this self-consciousness, self-awareness, the philosophy of the I am, and he moves us in the direction of a subjective idealism. The, sub the subjective idealism that is ultimately rooted in people like Plato, Plotinus, and the Christian tradition, this attempt to be self aware of not only one's own nature, but the nature of the world. So everything comes back to us, right? So contrary to the empiricists for Fichte, in order to have knowledge, in order to have any knowledge about the world, we must first be aware about who we are. We must have self-knowledge first. Only through self-knowledge can our innate ideas then be validated by experience, and only through self-knowledge will we become aware of our surroundings, right? And so that is the context unto which uh, Fichte arrives. He's playing with the synthetic a priori and the noumenon from Kant, but he thinks Kant did not do enough in recognizing the, that which is implicit in Plato and Plotinus and became more explicit in Christian philosophy, this notion of the self, this notion of the self. And Fichte's so-called subjective individualism, and this is not like, this is not really a, a relativism as we might think of that term today, but Fichte's subjective individualism is rooted in this idea of of the self. And he's also building from somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas here who recognizes that subjectivity, right, consciousable subjectivity leads to difference in human beings. And this is a long tradition that Fichte is aware in, in the Christian, in Christian philosophy. You get this especially in uh, the great monastic works, uh, St. Benedict and St. Gregory, for instance, uh, the monastic rule, the rule of Benedict and the pastoral rule, right? Everybody has unique subjective, subjective needs. And you can also see why Fichte is going to want to recourse to this and to re-embrace this because this is another way you challenge the nihilism of the tabula rasa, right? If we recall tabula rasa, we have no, we have no innate ideas. We, in essence, don't really have a nature anymore. It's a blank slate, and you're able to fill this blank slate with whatever uh, society, which is the social contract, desires. And that is what the, that is the core of social contract philosophy as it emerged from Hobbes and Locke. We needed the blank slate in order to create a social contract society and politics that allowed for that mechanistic and deterministic uh, philosophy of life and philosophy of politics to emerge and to flourish. But if you, if you, if you recognize the problem here, what this basically means is that all human beings are robots. We're essentially robots. We are nothing more than machines that can be tinkered with, we're machines that can be molded and formed into whatever we want, whatever we desire. Fichte thinks that this is the road not only to nihilism, but it's the road to political tyranny, right? So Fichte is arguing that in order to save reason, in order to save rationality, we must we must save the self. We must save 
this longer philosophy of self-consciousness. And so that is what Fichte is going to be doing throughout all of his works. And so now that we have this knowledge, the background and the context to Fichte established, we can begin to move into Fichte's philosophy. Now, Fichte writes on a multitude of subjects. We'll, I'll try to cover um, in brevity as many as possible. He writes on metaphysics. He writes on epistemology. He writes on ontology. He writes on aesthetics. And he writes on political philosophy. He also writes on political economy. Fichte is, as the historian and the philosopher uh, Vittoria Hosel said in his great book, uh, Short History of German Philosophy, Fichte really is one of the most brilliant philosophers who lived within the last 200 years. And it's a shame that so few people know him and even fewer people read him because he's also a tremendous influence on Hegel. Not only does Fichte establish a new philosophy of the self, a new philosophy of the I, a new philosophy of the I am, and a new philosophy of the subjective, he also is the one who actually uh, establishes the, the dialectic that we think of when we read Hegel, right? Fichte is the one who established this dialectic of self-conflict and self-overcoming. Again, he's getting that from Augustine, but he moves it in a slightly different direction of trying to make the abstract become concrete. That's another area where he broke from Kant. And he's the one that establishes the dialectic of the thesis, antithesis, and the, and the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Hegel never uses those, those uh, three words. Hegel uses the synthetic, uh, the synthetic, the antithetical, and I'm sorry, Hegel was the one who uses the idea of the positive, the negative, and the synthetic. That's, those are the three words that Hegel uses to describe his dialectical method. Fichte, in reviewing Hegel, uh, basically says, yeah, it's the same idea of the thesis, antithesis, and the synthesis. And that's why it's from, it's from Fichte that we read Hegel in that manner. But so Fichte is doing a lot in philosophy here. Fichte, rather than Kant, is generally recognized as the true father of German idealism and the true father of German romanticism because it's the establishment of Fichte's systematic philosophy of the self-conscious, the subjective, the I, the ego, as well as the abstract, concrete distinction that Hegel's definitely going to be playing with in his philosophy. It's Fichte's establishment of all of this which is now going to be the formal foundation for German idealism and Romanticism. But again, Kant, in a way, Kant is sort of like, he, he can be understood as the father of German idealism and Romanticism, but the better way to understand Kant, which is why we spent the first two lectures with Kant, is that Kant is the bridge. Kant is the bridge to German idealism and German Romanticism because it's Kant who establishes the systematic foundations in metaphysics and epistemology that reunite the transcendental with the empirical, that reunited the phenomenological with the noumenal. And so that is the foundation from which, again, Fichte inherited and then played with. And then it's through Fichte's establishment of all these new philosophies in metaphysics and ontology that give rise to people like Hegel and the rest of the German Romantic tradition. So when we, re when we return, we will begin to look at Fichte. Uh, the first lecture will go through Fichte's uh, political economy in Der Geslochene Handelstadt. Again, this is where you will see Fichte's most immediate and visible inheritance of the synthetic a priori and the noumenon from Kant. And this is also the most, uh, this is the area where you will most visibly see where Fichte uh, moved away from Kant. Because if we remember from Kant, uh, 
his philosophies of the synthetic a priori and the noumenon, Fichte is going to argue it implies the abstract concrete distinction, but for Kant, the concrete is already here. The concrete is already that which is, because you have that unity of the noumenal with the phenomenological, but we, we are unable to access other areas uh, within that noumenal world. This is where Kant argues the reason why, I'm sorry, Fichte argues the reason why Kant had to make that move is because he did not do enough with the philosophy of the self. And so through the philosophy of the self, as well as through the emergence of this idea of historicism that's going to become very popular in German Romantic thought, we can, in fact, begin to move beyond the synthetic a priori and have a full knowledge of the noumenal world that we live in.